Dad, can we go to the metaverse, please? No, son. We have the metaverse at home. Hello, and welcome back to the series where I do a deep dive into some of the hottest crypto and NFT games and review them from the perspective of a gamer. Today, the subject of our research is the crypto NFT blockchain metaverse create anything you want game with land ownership and play to earn features, the sandbox. The sandbox is one of the most popular additions to the ever growing collection of metaverses, and it's easy to see why. Boasting partners such as Adidas, the show Hell's Kitchen, Care Bears, and most importantly, the South China Morning Post, the sandbox brings an opportunity for people with money to share their most uninspired and sickeningly boring creations with the rest of the world. With big names like these backing it, what can go wrong with the sandbox? It can't be much worse than Decentraland after all. With the bar for crypto gaming set so low it's under the floor, it's time for us to jump right into the next game. The sandbox is a virtual world where players can build, own, and monetize their gaming experiences on the Ethereum blockchain. The sandbox was created with one simple goal in mind to topple the industry titans of Roblox and Minecraft by providing creators with the only game where they can truly own their creations. That's right, that one-to-one -one scale recreation of the White House you made in Minecraft, or your Among Us Find the Imposter Obby in Roblox? You don't own those. What happens when the games get shut down? Don't you wish that there was some sort of linked list database that contained all of the games and who created it? Oh wait, they're already on a database? Well, this one's decentralized, stupid, so it's better. Man. You're just like the people who thought that the telephone or that the internet would never catch on. Have fun staying poor. With such an ambitious claim, I had to check this game out for myself. Heading to the Sandbox's website and, I'm already so confused. There's really not so much about the game presented right up front. At least with the central end, the first thing we got was a play button. You'd think as, you know, a game, the Sandbox would be interested in attracting players by making the play button the center of the screen. After scrolling through page after page telling me how I can buy land and how I have a limited time to do so, I find a place where I can create a character. Gross. What in the world is this? This has to be one of the ugliest art styles I've ever seen. The Sandbox has decided to use a voxel art style, which is rather common and quite popular nowadays. However, they've used way too many cubes and it makes all of the characters look horrendous. Looking at Minecraft and Roblox as a comparison, both of these have six cubes per player. You tell me which looks better. That's right, it's the sandbox, because more cubes equals more better. Of course, for peasants like us who don't have an NFT, we can't create our own avatar in this metaverse because we have no proof of ownership. Instead, we'll have to borrow some avatars from the sandbox. Let's take a look at some of those premium avatars though. On second thought, I think I'm fine with the free avatars after all. Man, these metaverse games really don't like to give instructions. You know how Dark Souls doesn't hold your hand at the beginning and that's one of the things that makes it so good? Well, these crypto game developers must have heard that and then decided that they want to top of the leaders in the game tutorial industry too. Now, not only do you have to teach yourself how to play the game, you have to figure it out for yourself how to actually download and launch the game too. After clicking around on the website a little bit longer, I finally find a place called Sportsland, which has a game that I can play. So I click here and download and install the game. Once it finishes, it launches me into the game, and... This isn't even Sportsland. It's taking me somewhere completely different. I guess the blockchain allows the game to know what I want to play better than I do. The performance is a breath of fresh air from the last game we played. A constant 60 FPS with smooth controls and a responsive jump. This is amazing. I walk up to the first yellow exclamation point I see, because ever since World of Warcraft, a yellow exclamation point has pretty much been a universal symbol in gaming for Go Here. The butterfly, it says. So, I'm guessing that this world is one that has many different minigames to play, and this must be one of them. The sign here reads, This might be the most wonderful walk you ever experienced. Meet the butterfly at the end of the road. Are you ready? Now that's one bold claim. I'll be surprised if this walk's more exciting than taking the trash to the curb. Following along the path of the skybox of the metaverse, we step right over some NPCs who are a lot less fortunate. These guys must really suck to have failed this game. Either that, or they knew what the rest of the game was like, and they've just decided to take the easy way out. The path in total took less than 30 seconds to walk and had no obstacles along the way, and at the end, there's a butterfly I can collect. Hoping that this was just one of the examples of maybe a hidden tutorial, I try to play the next game. 
Did I mention the music in this world? Here, have a listen while I play the next game. This has to be some sort of a joke, right? I check in the chat to see if there's anyone else here, and a quick run around the area proves that there's nobody else here. Nobody else is stupid enough to play in this sandbox. Heading back to the game's website, I can navigate the map to pick a different world to play. The sandbox metaverse is a little bit different than the Decentraland one. In Decentraland, as difficult as it was, you could in theory walk from any plot to another with no loading screens. In the sandbox, however, each world is a different game instance that must be launched. Think of it like the sandbox game that you just downloaded was just the engine, and these links on the website allow you to launch different games to play within that engine. But I mean, if this is what they're considering a metaverse now, wouldn't that make literally every game ever released also a metaverse? While Sportsland loads, I notice that this is labeled as single player. Well, no wonder why nobody answered my chat messages. This game doesn't even support multiple players. I load into Sportsland and talk to a couple of the NPCs. Each one of them just gives me a different quest to collect or find different objects scattered around the small world. These collectible objects, of course, are placed with no care at all. They're just scattered around completely randomly. Completing a laughably easy obstacle course brings me to this soccer field, where I find an NPC requesting me to score three goals to win some trophies. Cool, this is better than collecting items, let's try it. I press E to dribble the soccer ball and then just walk straight to the goal. They might as well just said, hey, stand here and imagine that you kicked the soccer ball into the goal. Congrats, here's your trophy. After being bored out of my mind playing soccer, I aimlessly continue wandering the world, seeing nothing else interesting. More collectibles, more quests, and NPCs that have nothing of interest to say. Now unlike Decentraland, where the game was so horrendously bad in every aspect that it was actually funny to see what surprise would be around each corner, the sandbox is so numbingly boring that I can't force myself to spend more than 5 minutes here. Before leaving this world to try out the others though, I check out the objects that have links to view them on a marketplace. Here, it looks like the creators of each world can sell some of the assets they used as NFTs. Clearly they aren't popular though, as most of them have only sold one or two out of the thousands they've created. Plus, these prices make no sense. $337 for a basketball hoop? $28 for half of a basketball court? $1683 for a house? Who's buying these? Oh right, nobody. Deciding to leave this snooze fest, I head back to the Sandbox website to take a look at the massive map that I was presented with when first opening the site. Here, I can see plots of land with some of those big names that they proudly named on their homepage. This must be where I can actually play the games made by those brands. After clicking on over 20 of these plots, I now learn that you can't actually play any of these. There's either no way for people to publish games to play here, or nobody's actually made a game yet, they've just speculated on land. At this point, this is just an advertisement board. A bunch of these plots, when you click on them, either give you a link to buy an NFT collection, or just have a link to the website for the brand that's associated with the plot. It seems that the fad of NFTs has continued to spread like the plague through corporate America and Hollywood. However, it's clear that almost 99% of them are just in it for the money, especially Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg's been a constant name in the NFT and crypto world this past year, with stuff like that atrocious Bored 8 music video among many, many NFT collections on OpenSea. Of course, Snoop Dogg's adventures into the future of technology do not stop in the sandbox. Owners of the Snoop Doggies NFT will be allowed some of the following benefits. Early access to the Snoopverse, getting involved in the development of said Snoopverse, exclusive NFT drops, and rewards in the Snoopverse play to earn. But for those of you who just can't get enough of the Snoop D-O-double-G, you can purchase the highly exclusive Snoop Dogg private party pass for only $314. Hurry now, sale ends December 27th. This will make a perfect stocking stuffer for your family's resident crypto bro, and will definitely help him feel better after that awkward Thanksgiving dinner this year when Grandpa asked him how his Dogecoins were doing, and if they've mooned yet. Besides, how much did you think a ticket to Snoop Dogg's first Metaverse concert would be? Come on! You know, the same Snoop Dogg that live-streamed on Twitch for a week with the sound muted and chat set to emoji-only mode. Am I still streaming? In the Metaverse, he's a genius. There's only a few more worlds I can actually play, so let's check out a different world that's also named Sportsland. More of the same stuff, of course. Walking around a world, picking up collectibles. 
While the world design here is certainly passable, there's just nothing to do. I managed to find two activities that weren't just simple collectibles. One was a two question quiz on soccer, which I failed. And two was this game where you fill in as a goalie while some guy named John Honda kicks balls way too fast for you to ever predict. Besides, there's no score tracking or anything, so you might as well just walk away. At this point, I'm completely filled with rage and take out my anger on John Honda. This does nothing. I do a quick lap of the area to make sure I didn't miss anything and close the sandbox. Let's try the last game, the only one that's multiplayer. Big surprise, the play button is grayed out. I decided to head to the Discord to ask for some help, and here I learned that multiplayer is not actually available in the alpha. So I'm really not too sure why they even show this here. I guess it's their way of saying that one day they might add multiplayer to this game. But come on, really? There's nobody even playing this game. There isn't a single message in the Discord in recent months about the actual gameplay. It's just people asking which plots of land are going to be worth the most money, or advertising their new NFT release. Why do these people think that their land is going to have any value when they're not even in the game playing it? At this point, I've now seen everything that the litter box has to offer. How many people even play this game anyway? Let's check. What? 300,000 monthly active users? Oh, okay, it's just reported by the sandbox themselves. Dapradar, an independent yet unreliable source, seems to indicate that the number is closer to 500 people per week. Even that seems a bit too high, but we'll give them credit. Similar to Decentraland, the sandbox has a total valuation of almost $1 billion, of course, yet there's no one playing this game. It looks ugly and makes no attempt to have fun gameplay, instead attracting the player base through rewarding them with cryptocurrency for interacting with the worlds. So, you're pretty much just getting paid to watch ads. The sandbox tokens, called SAND, have fallen over 90% from $7 one year ago to today's current price of $0.54. Cents. To absolutely no one's surprise, the sandbox in its current state offers nothing to people who enjoy gaming, and even less to people who enjoy having fun. But where did this game even come from? How does a developer of two rather poorly received mobile games turn into a billion dollar blockchain powerhouse? I did a bit of research into the company behind the sandbox, and what I found ended up making the goal of this game pretty obvious. Now, the company that originally developed the sandbox mobile titles for Android and iOS, Pixel, was bought out by a company called Animoca Brands in 2018. Then, at that point, the development for Pixel's latest game, which I can only assume was the sandbox, was completely repurposed into what eventually became the sandbox today. Animoca Brands is a Hong Kong crypto venture capital company. Animoca's entire business model seems to be buying small mobile games and adding cryptocurrency integration to it before quickly shutting it down and moving on to the next. They also have a history of working with licensed games. And would you look at the list of licenses they've used? It's the same ones that are in the sandbox. It's pretty clear that the entire goal of the sandbox was just to capitalize on the stupidity of crypto speculators by entering the market with an actual playable game early on in the metaverse craze. It's the project of a company that has nothing more than a history of mass-produced, low-quality licensed smartphone games, and has successfully separated almost a billion dollars from thousands of people by promising them an early seat at the metaverse table. Unfortunately, nobody wants to sit there. After all this torture, it's finally time to give the sandbox a five-point review. 1. Ease of Access Getting into this game, if you can even call it that, is extremely difficult. They make every effort possible to sell you something before you even play the game by placing all these land purchases right in front of you and hiding the actual download and play button deep in the website. And I'm not the only person who thought this, as a quick browse through the game subreddit shows others asking the same question. How in the world do I play this game? What the sandbox has is not ease of access. It's intentionally making it hard to play the game so that you're tricked to spending money before trying it. They give you all these pop-ups telling you you have a limited time to buy land, and when land runs out, it'll never go on sale again. This is extremely predatory and borderline evil. Good thing that I don't think a real gamer has ever actually played this game. 1 out of 5 here, because I could launch the game after all, and that's better than some of the games we've seen in the past on this series. Point number 2, the gameplay. When the team behind the sandbox is telling you that they have plans to topple Minecraft and Roblox, you can't help but laugh. This is a pitiful excuse for a game, and while it runs smoothly, it's nothing more than a tech demo for a voxel-based world editor. There's some key features missing from this game that even Decentraland had, including the ability to lose in some form, and to keep score. For something that's been in development for four years now, it makes you wonder just how much money those developers are getting paid. 
I would love to have their job, as they didn't even have to show up to work to make a billion dollars. Negative 16 out of 5. Point 3, the graphics. The game runs great, 60 FPS. But that's not a surprise with how little is going on, and the fact that the game's just single player. The voxel art style, which is a pretty simple one, somehow manages to look atrocious. The choice to model realistic looking humans and the inclusion of classic disgusting computer generated NFT art is just a train wreck. There's no soul and no energy in this game's art style. I hate it. Zero out of five. Point four, the value of NFT and crypto technology. As usual, the only reason this game has crypto is because crypto is a fad and the venture capital firm that bought the developers of the sandbox loves to include crypto in all their games. In fact, this parent company is the same one that made that Formula One NFT game that shut down this year, leaving everyone's NFTs useless. What a good track record. Not to mention that the blockchain is not even directly implemented into the game's client in any way. Everything that does use the blockchain is just on the game's website, so clearly they just tacked the blockchain on top of an existing game here. I have to give this a Shadow Realm out of 5. The garbage box is somehow an insult to gamers and crypto fans. Point five, will this project succeed? What do you think? There's nobody in this metaverse. The Discord is only populated by admins and people with .f at the end of their name asking which NFTs they should buy next to flip for a profit. The Sandbox subreddit gets maybe four posts per month. And when you look at some of the most recent NFTs that they have in the game, you can see most of them only have one or two sales, which could even just mean it's the creator of the NFT buying it to generate fake hype. The Sandbox has successfully scammed almost a billion dollars at this point but it looks like there's not much gas left in their tank. With the mainstream metaverse that Facebook has created being a complete laughing stock, there's no way that this game would fly when presented to the average gamer. If the team behind the sandbox thinks that they can become more popular than Roblox with this, they've overdosed on Hopium. Zero out of five. In conclusion, the sandbox is a flaming pile of garbage that isn't even so bad it's funny. It's just straight up worthless. Anyone who looks at this and thinks that this is the future of gaming either has never played a video game in their life or is being completely dishonest. I don't believe that there's a single person who legitimately thinks that the current state of this game is good. Sorry that I got a little bit angry during this video, but the sandbox was just so horrendously bad that it sent me into a fit of blind rage. The support that you gave my last video was amazing, and thanks to you all, I'm on my way to reaching 100 subscribers after only a week on YouTube. I started this channel with the goal of exposing poor quality NFT and crypto games simply by playing them and giving them an honest review. Your support's made it clear to me that while most people don't want to play these games themselves, they'll gladly watch me suffer through them. If you haven't noticed, I completely abandoned that list of games that we started with in the first video, since the rest of them were just scams or required a $200 purchase to play. Instead, what we'll be doing for the rest of the series is continuing the same type of video where I actually play and review a game instead of just exposing a pointless scam. As always, please like the video, subscribe, and keep leaving comments with suggestions for the next game to play. I'm John, and please, please do not play this game. Goodbye.